Good morning and welcome to Adventure Christian Church Online. Please join us and worship with our Lord.
As we come to this third song titled, You Are God Alone, we are getting ready for our meditation with God in our communion, Lord's Supper. Anything we 
Hello, church. Um, it's your pastor, Ken Hayscamp. Um, love y'all. We're having a great time in the state of Missouri. I'm sorry for the sunglasses, but we have literally stopped. If you'll notice behind me, that is a rest stop. And I'm going to swing around. There's my lovely bride. So there's Susan. And there's where the trucks park. And those cars going by out there are a part of Interstate 70. So we are on the eastbound side as we are heading from Kansas City where we just saw her brother uh, back to St. Louis where we will be with uh, our other family that lives back there. Um, Stop at a rest stop. I had a couple ideas for the Lord's Supper meditation this week. The problem is I ran out of the hotel too quick for a, a you got my first one. It was really been good. You'd have loved it. So this one, uh, we're at a rest stop. I want to read a scripture to you. This is Jesus from uh, Matthew 11. Uh, I believe it's verse 28. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble. It, excuse me, I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. Now, a lot of you know, and some of you don't know, I used to be a truck driver. And uh, in fact, I'm, I'm watching a couple of semis uh, get squared up in their, uh, their parking spots out here right now, and I have memories of that. The, these stops are uh, vital. And uh, when some of the states close their stops because of this COVID-19 mess, they really put a kibosh on truck drivers because once again, we gotta have these places. They are necessary. You and I have to have places of rest. Rest stop along the highway, a vacation once in a while. Jesus. So what you're doing right now is you're going to commune with the Lord. Now you choose what you make of this. But it can be a place of rest. You can come to the arms of Jesus during the Lord's Supper and just relax. You got a care? You've got a fear? Take it to him. He wants you to find rest in his name. So I pray that you will. Right now. Give whatever's burdens on your heart, whatever is difficult, give that to Christ. He will give you rest. Let's pray together. Father, I love you, and I'm so thankful that we can share in the, with these crazy ways. That even when uh, Satan tries to close down the church, we just find different ways of reaching out to each other. I pray for those who are about to partake of the Lord's Supper. Father, I pray for those that didn't come prepared for that, but they're still here and they're listening, and there's a burden on their heart. I pray right now why... The band plays and sings that they would give that burden up to you and that Jesus in your name I pray they would be given rest right now for just a little time once again we love you father I thank you so much for taking such great care of us Jesus thank you for providing rest through your sacrifice on the cross and the empty tomb which we celebrate now in the Lord's Supper. And it's in Christ's name we pray, amen.
I'm Kodiak. I'm the associate pastor for Adventure Christian here in Patterson, California. Uh, if you've been watching the communion devos, you probably notice I'm not wearing a hat this week. Uh, let's just say that I got a little impatient and now my hair is long enough that I feel it's presentable. So enough said. Uh, whether you're a regular attender or just checking us out, uh, I want to welcome you and thank you for joining us for this online service. I know a lot of churches are opening back up. Uh, we hope to be doing that soon. Uh, but if you are particularly at risk, or even if you have a job that blocks off your Sundays, uh, our services will continue to be available, both live and on demand, on our YouTube channel after the fact, uh, for even after we start meeting in person for the foreseeable future. Uh, some other fun stuff, if you haven't yet, give us a follow on our new Instagram page. We'll be posting some fun stuff that we're up to on that, and Ken and I will also be posting some midweek devotionals, so be sure to check that out. Uh, you can find us under Adventure CCP on Instagram. Uh, also, keep an eye out for an email this week. Um, I've been, I'm still trying to get familiar with everyone. Uh, I thought it would be cool to have a little get-together uh, with a bonfire and some breakfast burritos. Uh, so keep an eye out for that email. I'll be sending out a sign-up and also a date for that. So anyways, I went home to Santa Cruz last week for Father's Day and got to spend some time at the beach. Uh, it was so cool to see things are starting to open back up again. Uh, look a little bit more normal. Uh, but in brainstorming for this message and sitting by the ocean, I figured, what better to talk about than Jonah? The story of Jonah is one that just about everyone you know has probably heard of. Uh, you've probably heard dozens of sermons on it like I have. If you grow up in church, it was probably taught to you in Sunday school. Uh, or maybe you just saw the VeggieTales movie on it. It actually made it to theaters. I remember that being the coolest thing. Uh, whether or not you've grown up in church, you've probably heard of Jonah. And you probably know the gist of the story, just like I remember this. That God commanded Jonah to go to Nineveh and to tell the people to repent of their wickedness. But then out of fear, Jonah runs away in the other direction and climbs aboard a ship. But then the ship, or the, as they're sailing, a storm meets them, and the sailors are so afraid because the storm is so violent, they think the ship's gonna tear apart, so the sailors take roll call. Somebody's God is acting up here. Who made their God angry? And Jonah says, that'd be me. So they cast him into the sea, the storm fades away, and Jonah is swallowed by a great fish. And then for three days he spends repenting until this fish spits him out. And then he makes his way to Nineveh, he preaches, and the people repent. It's an amazing story. There's so many different lessons that we take from just this little book of the Bible. There's the power of God, the power to be able to control a fish and for... Jonah to be unharmed after three days. It's amazing. The power of repentance. There's the way that God continues to guide us and pull us into the direction he has for us, even if we want to go the other way. It's an amazing story. We've got all the elements here for what we call the narrative of the reluctant hero. But then we get to chapter 4. And Jonah, one of the great heroes of the Bible, he sits outside the city and he waits for it to burn. And he's angry because God doesn't do it. 
Why? If I was just trying to write a cool story, I would have ended at chapter 3. And God saw the people had turned from their evil ways. It's a happy ending. But then we get to chapter 4. Chapter 4 completely changes the way that we look at this story. It moves the focus of, of the story, not on the power of God, even though that miracle is fantastic, the way he controls the fish is fantastic. The focus is not the message of repentance, even though it's a vital message, even though every other prophet in the Old Testament has this message of repentance. Remember that God uses the prophets uh, to warn the people and the kings of Israel and Judah uh, to turn away from their injustice and their idolatry. Jonah has that same message, but that's not the focus of this story. Chapter 4 turns the story to Jonah himself. What's going on here? I want to take a deeper look at the tale of Jonah. But as we're doing this, I want us to keep this question in the back of our minds. It's a question that I think in a time of widespread tension and anger, we have to continuously bring ourselves back to this. Hold on to this. Who belongs to God? Who belongs to God? Starting in... Chapter 1 of Jonah. Now the word came, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, saying, Arise, go to the great city of Nineveh, and call out against it, for their evil has come up against me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord. Why does he run away? Now at this time, Assyria was the dominant world power, and the king of Assyria was Sennacherib, and under his rule, they brutalized the people of Israel and every other nation that they attacked. It was at that time Jonah was alive that after years of defending against the sieges on Israel that they finally fell and many people were taken away into exile and many people were just slaughtered. In the records found in Sennacherib's palace, uh, we get a picture of just how brutal the Assyrians were to those that they conquered. People were beheaded and dismembered, impaled on stakes. There are depictions of Jews being dragged naked through the streets. Those that were kept alive were then forced into slavery where they had to build siege ramps and some of them were even forced to attack their own people. It's not too hard to believe that Jonah may have had friends or family or neighbors that were slaughtered and then put on display. Best case scenario, he doesn't know anybody specifically, but he still knew the plight of his people. Jonah's people, God's people, were suffering. And Nineveh was one of Assyria's greatest cities one of the most well-known for their cruelty and their violence. Well over a 100,000 people lived there. And everything about this city is a testament to the power of, this, of Assyria and the detriment of the Hebrews. And God tells Jonah, go and warn them to repent. Why does he run away? You could suppose that he's afraid for his life. That seems perfectly reasonable. Uh, the Ninevites were a violent people who wouldn't be afraid. But then watch Jonah on the boat as the wind and the storm rages and the men are in a panic. Jonah's asleep. When they wake him, they shake him awake and they ask, Who are you? How can you sleep? How are you not afraid? Jonah says to them, I fear the God who created the sea and the wind and the land. Jonah isn't afraid for his life. He knows who has control. Suppose he's afraid of his own abilities. Maybe he's insecure about uh, that his message would fall on deaf ears. Maybe he's afraid of failure. 
This doesn't seem that likely in light of the first example, uh, but I think this is something that all of the prophets were faced with. They had to deal with this. It was because of the calls for repentance fell, falling on deaf ears that Israel was overtaken in the first place. It's a very common, it's a very human feeling for all of us, not just preachers, not just prophets, to come to a point where we ask ourselves, am I even making a difference? Is the world any better because of me? What am I doing? That's a common thing. But again, Jonah knew his God. I don't think he was afraid of failure. In this instance, though, I, I think he was actually afraid he'd be successful. He finally goes on to preach through the city, and everyone from the least to the greatest cry out in repentance. Even the animals were made to fast and to mourn and wear sackcloth. Even the animals repented. I call that success. And God saw how they turned from their evil, and he had compassion, and he relented. Then Jonah leaves the city in a huff, and he cries out, I knew that you would do this. I knew that you're a God of compassion and mercy. This is why I ran in the first place. Why is he so angry? See, Jonah is torn between two theologies. He has two competing ideas about who God is and how God should operate. On one hand, he's a Hebrew, and God is the God of the Hebrews. He who walks in righteousness and loves the law will be blessed, but those who are against me will be put to shame. He wants those who cause him pain to be put to shame. That's one theology. On the other end, he's a Hebrew, and God is the God of all creation. The God who through the Hebrews, all people would come to know him in heaven and on earth. Every knee bow, every tongue confess, all nations come to know God. Who belongs to God? The Hebrews belong to God. And the Ninevites belong to God. There's an old allegory that when... The Israelites fled from Egypt and were chased across the Red Sea after God had closed the waters and drowned the Egyptian army. There were angels in heaven cheering, but then God rebukes them. They said, but God, they were after the Israelites. They would have harmed your people. We saved them. And then God replies, the Egyptians are also my people. Now, don't take that story as a real event. Here's the point. God does not delight in his judgment. The brokenness of this world is a tragedy. God wants all people to walk with him. And when they walk away, I believe that God feels the pain of that loss. Now, God more powerful, more reasonable than us. He is not so overcome by his emotions that he just simply ignores the evil of the world, but he gives us every opportunity to come to him. It's because of him and his love for us that he sends Jesus so that all nations and the Hebrews and all of us could have every opportunity to come to him. Where Jonah gets caught up here is he thinks he knows where God needs to stop giving those opportunities. He anticipates Nineveh's destruction because he wants to enact his judgment over God's judgment. Now, Jonah has a lot of justifiable pain and grief because of the Ninevites, because of the Assyrians. That's not in question here, but sometimes our emotions get in the way of the fact that sometimes we are called to love those who cause us the most pain. 
the love that we are called to can be so difficult when we're faced with that which hurts and offends us the most, but we cannot let our pain distract us from the fact that it is a tragedy that the world is in the state that it's in because there are people who walk away from God, because the world walks away from God. We cannot lose our focus because you may be the person to point someone else to Jesus. Our faith is meant to be a light that points other people to Jesus. But when we withhold our love and compassion, we're hiding away that light. We make it harder for other people to see Jesus. So what do we do? How do we love better? My belief is that every Christian needs to be continuously growing and improving in the art of self-examination. Self-examination. We cannot grow if we don't believe we need to. It's one thing to say, those people need to change. It's a different one to say, I need to change. And the Spirit of God does so much of that work for us. But we have to be able to dig around and say, God, I have this mess. Could you work on it? Inside ourselves is the answer to why we struggle to with, with withholding love to others and who those people are. We have to be practiced in self-examination. Now, Jonah gives us a great example. Oftentimes, it's those that cause us pain who we hold the most against. But sometimes, it's that which we see in ourselves that prevents us from loving others. Just an aside, my family adopted a few cats. They're cute little suckers. Uh, by the way, Ken's nowhere. I'm probably standing right here somewhere in the garage right now. Ken's nowhere nearby, but I can still hear him shaking his head. But I think they're fun. Uh, one of my favorite things is how they react to themselves in the mirror. Uh, one of the cats, right after we got it, it got to the house. Uh, it spent a couple hours just running around and hiding and coming back out. And every few minutes you'd hear a bang on the mirror. And then it'd start squaring itself up against the mirror and trying to fight it. Because it doesn't realize that that's him. I think my favorite was back in high school, I had a lizard, um, and they just never catch on. So any time you put them, they're always just trying to fight. It's cute when animals do it. Not so much when we do it. Do you remember when it happened to King David? Nathan, the prophet, came into the throne room that day and he said there was a wealthy man with a hundred lambs who had a guest. And instead of slaughtering one of his own, he went to his neighbor, who only had one which he loved. And the wealthy man stole it in the night. That's outrageous. That's unacceptable. I want this man found. He's going to pay for his crimes. He deserves death for this. He'll pay it back fourfold. Who is this man? You are this man. You are that man. No. I know. If you struggle to have compassion on someone else, sometimes it may be your own reflection getting in the way. I had a roommate once that I got so annoyed with because he would stay up on a regular basis till two in the morning and he would argue with his xbox i told my best friend who i'd also been roommates before with about it and he laughed and he said you used to do that i said no not like this guy and he said yeah kind of like that guy does for shame i had a roommate once in college that uh i had a roommate once in college I had a roommate once in college that I got really annoyed with because he would stay up late on, like till 2 in the morning on a regular basis and he would argue with his Xbox. 
and I told my best friend, who I had also been roommates before with, about it. And he laughed at me and says, dude, you used to do that. I said, no, not like this guy does. He said, yeah, a little like that guy does. Her shame. We live in a world that is broken and hurting. And it's in desperate need of God. The last thing that the world needs is for us to withhold our love and compassion. In fact, when things get bad, when it gets harder to do, that's when we're called to love more. God, you are the creator of all things and of all people. Break our hearts, God, for what breaks yours. Would you help us to love others like you love us? As we were once lost, help us to be a light for those in need of you. In Jesus' name, amen.